Thank you, everyone, for staying for this long today. Uh, we are about to start our last panel of the day, talking about opportunities and future of debt relief options. Uh, we have Alice Hurdy here as our moderator. She is the principal uh, assistant director of supervision policy. Um, and she, Alice, take it away. Take oh, it away. thank you. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, and obviously we always save the best for last, and so we have a terrific panel here to draw on all the excellent conversation that has occurred throughout the day, and I'll echo other uh, moderator and panelists' thanks to the markets team at John McNamara and Vanessa and the whole team uh, for putting together a great uh, dialogue today. So we're going to continue that dialogue, and I'll first introduce our panel panelist to my immediate left is Sean Fox, president of Freedom Debt Relief, the largest debt relief company in the U.S. Sean has had executive experience in various businesses for the past 20 years, and he began his, his career as an attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, next to him is Andrew Pizer, a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center's Washington, D.C. office. Andrew works on issues related to consumer debt, and he contributes significantly to NCLC's various treatises, uh, which are widely used and very much uh, respected and appreciated, including on federal deception law and other of those publications. Then we have the respected part. I didn't write that for. No, no, I'm. I <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that is uh, from personal experience. Uh, Rebecca Steele is uh, the president and chief executive officer of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. She has had more than 20 years' experience managing some of the nation's largest and complex residential mortgage banking businesses, and spent much of her career both at J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America. And then. To my furthest left is Jason Swift, who is Chief Operating Officer and BSA Officer of Marlett Funding, LLC. His responsibilities include strategic planning and operations for application and loan servicing, loan verification, fraud loan funding, collections, and asset recovery at Marlett, which is a marketplace online lender. So. With this, with this great lineup, we're going to have a great discussion, and I think I'll just kick it off and ask each of our panelists to say in a few, you know, a few sentences or more uh, what you see as the key risk to consumers in this market that you think need to be addressed. So I'll start with Sean. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, and, and thank you to the CFPB for putting this on. Um, I, I um, you know, I'm really hopeful about this conversation because I think it can kick off something that can go beyond today. Um, you know, this industry um, does have a significant amount of attention that comes on it. Um, many of the things that have been said today, for example, I could easily raise my hand as, as Dan Frazier was saying, he wanted to raise his hand the whole time and say, wait, wait, how about my point of view? Um, and I, I feel as though um, there's a dialogue that needs to happen, and this is really just the beginning from my perspective. Um, in terms of risk for consumers, I mean, I think um, many of them have been raised already. Consumers need to be educated and need to understand what they are um, doing when they enter into a program. And I'll, I'll just be specific to debt settlement because that's where a lot of the energy has been. Um, disclosures related to what will happen as part of debt settlement are critical to our business, are critical to the way that we operate as the largest debt settlement company, debt relief company. Um, and so being in a position where that is the standard, and we believe it is, and um, being able to explain that to the outside world is really critical. I think ultimately um, people understanding what goes on in the context of debt settlement as opposed to assuming, I think facts and data are going to be really critical for the conversation going forward to really understand what these risks are, not the outdated assumptions that folks might have. And the only way to kind of deal with that is for us to have a conversation and folks literally come and see what's going on. So that's one of the things that I've done with all kinds of different um, parties to, so they can understand kind of how we operate um, is to physically come to our operation and see what we do and have that conversation. So big, big point, 
disclosures seems to be a theme that's running through and the consumer not understanding what's going on. Um, and I'd love to have the dialogue. I can go through others because frankly there were 10 probably brought up as part of this conversation as the day has gone on. Hard to address them all, but that's one to hit front and center and I'm sure we'll get to others as we go. Thanks, Sean. Andrew. Um, I guess I have a bit of a counterpoint to that. I think the biggest risk is um, complexity. And that, that comes out in a number of different ways. Um, the flip side maybe is transparency. There's, it's so hard for consumers to evaluate these products, to know which one is right, which product is right, which company is right, um, because there's just so many things to think about. A lot of it is not transparent. Um, there's a lot of advertising. Some of it is false advertising. Some of it's true. There are lots of disclosures, but um, you know, understanding all of them is, you know, people aren't given a PhD in how to evaluate disclosures. So no matter what product you're getting, it's a loan, debt, debt relief. It's really hard to know what you're getting and if it's right for you, and if the person on the other end of the phone is is telling you the truth about their product. Um, so I think you know. Dancing around a few points: complexity, transparency, um, you know, accuracy of the adver advertising. I think that's the biggest risk, the biggest problem for consumers. Rebecca, yeah, well, I think there are a ton of risks, and I just would start with uh, a lot of have been discussed today, but I think some haven't. I had the fortunate opportunity actually to work through the housing crisis the last ten years, and learned a lot from that. And the one question I would say is is making things much worse before they get better, is that re a requirement? How do we help these high-stressed consumers, and to Andrew's point, a very, very complex environment? Um, a couple things I would say about that is, I think it's really difficult to shop when you're stressed. So we said options are important, but shopping is difficult. It really is. Um, having a trusted source is really important for high-risk consumers. So who's that trusted source and how do I know that? Um, one thing on education I'll, I'll make a point about is education takes time. The pace has to be a little slower. You have to give consumers time to understand what the options are and work that through. So it can't be on one phone call. Um, we certainly learned that from high-pressure sales tactics in the mortgage business that, you know, enrolling someone in 20 minutes uh, sometimes is good, but most times is bad. Um, and these consumers, it's not one product, it's many different creditors. So somebody said earlier that it was like six to eight creditors. Yes, that's true. Sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's medical debt, sometimes they have rental issues, sometimes they have auto debt on top of it. So solving and understanding that problem is complex. Um, holistic education is important. So when we talk to creditors, it's very important that we're not just talking about you know, one creditor at a time. We have to solve all of them at the same time. And that leads to something else, which is not only lack of knowledge, but standards and consistency and the lack thereof in this sector is leading to a lot of risks and outcomes for our consumers. Um, one other thing about credit is, um, you know, do we have to make things worse before they get better? It's just been a standard in unsecured debt that you wait to charge off, regardless of whether there's harm done or regardless of whether there's a real hardship. So I'll say two things, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this on the panel, but one is effective means testing. So for a mortgage modification, for instance, you have to go through a very standardized means test that's attested to by the consumer. Okay, that ensures somewhat that we're going to really understand what their cash flow is and what their hardship is. And I think it's really important to use some of these principles that have worked in the past. And one other thing on disclosures is disclosures, and, and, and again, I'll go back to my housing experience, are very, very, very difficult for consumers to understand. We need to make it easier, simpler, and we might even want to think about putting like a net tangible benefit test in place. Okay, that might be a, an idea. Or high cost loan disclosures, high cost uh, debt relief options. Um, so we're sure, we're sure we're putting those risks in front of the consumers properly. Thank you, Jason. 
All right, so first I do want to take the opportunity again to thank the CFPB, the number of regulators, consumer advocate groups for putting this together. It has been uh, a long time coming. Uh, we've had conversations in pockets, one-on-one, -on -one, different forums, um, but to have this opportunity is really beneficial for everybody. Okay. So again, I do want to say, I know that debt settlement has been in the limelight today in particular, uh, but I do appreciate the fact that folks like Sean and, and Teresa and Dan are willing to sit here and have these conversations to actually change the industry. Mm -hmm. There are folks in the industry that are willing to do this, that are willing to meet with creditors individually uh, that do uh, invite us to their facilities and actually allow us to sit with agents and really learn the process and work with them to improve the process. So uh, mm -hmm. it's really appreciated that uh, it was said before a couple years ago, that would have never happened. You've rarely saw a creditor and a debt settlement company in the same room having a discussion, uh, and we see it today, so we appreciate that. The other thing I do uh, want to take back to, and it's been said a couple of times today, is like the consumer that we're talking about here, uh, these consumers are going through financial hardship for the most part. Uh, these are consumers that you know, have gone through situations where they've lost uh, their job, there's a reduction of income, uh, death of a spouse, uh, medical bills, whatever the case may be. The really positive part uh, about that situation is these consumers have some willingness or uh, have a willingness to pay and some ability to pay. These folks want to pay their debt. They want to get back on their feet. They want to be able to support their family. They're just scared to death and they really don't know how. And this particular group of people uh, represents a much larger group of people that uh, in one way has created complexity uh, in this overall process uh, throughout a number of years, uh, but also is the group of people that can reduce that complexity and create uh, a level of uh, understanding and transparency in this process that we currently don't have today. So the key risks that you know, really I identified are, are very similar ones that have been mentioned. So I think disclosures are important. All of us are required to do disclosures. It's really if we truly look and does a consumer that is going through a financial hardship, a consumer that is stressed and embarrassed to have these conversations, a vulnerable consumer, do they understand what they're being disclosed? So the risks to me are things like the consumer gets the wrong solution because they don't know what payment programs, what payment options are available to them. Not only from debt settlement companies, uh, but from organizations uh, that Re Rebecca represents, from creditors and other third parties. Consumers may enroll in programs that lack consumer protections. There are a number of programs out there that exist that have consumer protections. There are some that lack consumer protections. Consumer per, uh, enroll in programs that are destructive to their credit. That will potentially prevent credit in the future when these folks should have availability of credit. It may prevent them from getting certain uh, uh, things from a housing perspective. It may prevent them from getting a job. Uh, these, some of these programs are destructive to their credit and they need to understand uh, what they're getting into from that perspective. And the last thing that I would mention is unknowingly enrolling in programs that are, are very uh, costly. So, if they're going to enroll in programs that have higher expenses associated with them, it should be very clear and transparent to that consumer. Thank you. Those are all great comments that help lead into the next question for each of you to consider and answer, and it's this. What do you see as opportunities to improve the quality of options available to consumers and to expand consumer choice. So we've heard folks talk about fee structure, outcome success rates, finality. So Sean, I'll, I'll turn it to you to, to kick things off. Okay. Um, well, I think first to ensure that folks have access to the information. So the, the interesting conversation about disclosures, just to take like a minute to talk about how we actually ensure the consumers hear it multiple times. Now, the reality is, you don't know if people understand what you tell them literally three times in the process, but we have multiple stages where we will walk through specific disclosures and help them to understand the specifics of, you know, impact on your credit, um, litigation, threat of litigation. Uh, the impact of taxes. There are specific spots in the process where we do this verbatim from a script as part of the consultation, which by the way, it's not 20 minutes. It's on average two hours and 15 minutes. 
That's how much time we spend with someone, and it goes over multiple calls. It's typically two to three to four calls you'll, you'll have where you walk through this, and it's a process. It's not a one 20-minute conversation, because it's a big, big step for a consumer to take. So as you go through this, you have that initial consultation, and there'll be literally a verbatim discussion of disclosures. Next, you'll go through an agreement where you will see all of that, and you'll be, you'll be actually initialing key components of the disclosures as you go through it, basically looking at every page and every key component. And then finally, we get to what we call our quality assurance or our, our welcome call. We, this is outside of any enrollment team, and it is the operations team. Now, why is that important? The operations team is the team that's responsible for ensuring outcomes for consumers. Why is that important for me as a business? One thing that really hasn't come up today and it's been surprising to me is um, debt settlement was, was regulated back in 2010, 2011. And there was something called the advanced fee ban put in place. It has been mentioned but not emphasized enough. Our company does not make any revenue until a consumer's debt is settled. It's, that settlement is presented to the consumer and the consumer approves that settlement. Very few industries out there have that kind of an expectation. So um, we're in a situation where our incentives are absolutely aligned with the incentives of the consumer. I, the last thing that I, as the guy running Freedom Debt Relief, want is a consumer to come into a program, be confused about that program, in three months decide that now they don't like what's happening, the collection calls, the threat of litigation, whatever it might be, and then leave the program because I have incurred cost in numerous ways with debt consultants, with the onboarding, with the follow-up calls we dealt with for three or four months. So it is absolutely critical that folks understand that there's an alignment of interest there in terms of trying to get um, outcomes. Um, and, and you know, I, I can talk to you about how this ripples through the organization and how that affects what we do every day for hours. And I don't want to take everybody's time. I'm, I'm speaking too much already. Well, but, Sean, but maybe if you, yeah, it. and we appreciate that. So maybe you can focus on, do you see opportunities to improve options? Yeah, okay. So I just had to address what I saw as, yeah. yeah. So excuse we my passion. About, we, but, we, no, but we told yes. you, we knew so, you were going to do um, that. I, 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 so our access, access to the information, exactly. <laughs> access to the information and solution is critical. Um, creditor engagement. So we are strongly in favor of the idea that we engage with creditors. In fact, we have them come to our operation. We have conversations with them every day. We've built a team in our company to work with those creditors on a day-to-day -day basis to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of those interactions that we have around negotiations. That is incredibly important. Now, what we'd really like to see is that when a consumer comes into the program and they have a verifiable financial hardship, and we can talk about what a verifiable financial hardship is, um, but if we could get to the point where everybody agreed on what that verifiable financial hardship is, we then would expect the creditors to negotiate in good faith and not pursue strategies that are gonna be detrimental to consumers. That would be a better world. That would be a world that I think we could all, you know, objectively step back and say that works better. So I think creditor engagement when the hardship exists. Second is making other options available to the consumer. So one of the things I'm most proud about in the way we've run our business is that consumers who come to us, and they come to us, as most people point out, confused as to exactly what the solutions are. They don't know the difference between credit counseling, debt settlement, sometimes getting a personal loan. So the key is to ensure that folks get educated on those, those options um, as best you can. And we have, at this point, be, be, put ourselves in a position where we're actually sending more consumers to other solutions than come into debt settlement. That's been a key mantra for us. It's been a key objective is to work with credit counseling partners. I mean, Rebecca's folks that are members of her organization, we send consumers to them all day long because they're not a good fit for debt settlement. They don't have the level of stress that, that collectively we've confirmed by talking to them for two and a half hours is appropriate for them to go in, into um, debt settlement. So bottom line is we feel as though having other options available, and by the way, we have referrals to bankruptcy, credit counseling, we have a personal lending option, 
Um, it, we would um, absolutely be open to other solutions that folks have. We just launched actually a HELOC solution for certain consumers through our own company, which we think is a great solution for consumers that have significant amount of equity, but have you know, a limited amount of consumer card debt compared to that uh, equity. We want to do the responsible thing for consumers as a company. Um, and that ultimately, I think, is going to make um, you know, this industry and the entire thing much more sustainable and, and more consumer focused. Thank you, Sean. Andrew. Well, I, I think the best way to get more options is probably first to figure out what works. And um, I mean, we live in the era of big data, we analyze everything. And I think we really need to spend more time doing a comprehensive analysis of um, what's been tried, what's what's working, what hasn't. Um, you know, Sean mentions, I mean, I was surprised, frankly, to hear you say that you actually refer people to credit counseling and in bankruptcy because, you know, a lot of debt settlement places won't. And then, sadly, in the past, some credit counselors have been reluctant to do that. But, um, you know, there's some out there that probably don't do that. So maybe, maybe some impartial third party could do a deep dive into Sean's data and get the other parties in, and maybe we'll find out that, that what freedom does works and what the others don't, or vice versa, or something like that. What we really need to know is get a look at the, the consumer's big picture. You know, basically, you look at the consumer, their status before they go into whatever activity, debt settlement, bankruptcy, credit counseling, and then you look at them after they've left it, whether they've quit, been forced out, or um, completed the program. Mm -hmm. Look at how much everything has cost, including taxes, fees, the uh, service charges, the actual settlement, and try and figure out what worked best for them. And it might not just be a dollar amount. I mean, maybe people say, you know, I saved money, but I'm so stressed out, I'd wish I'd gotten it done quickly. Yeah. But I think that's the best way, is to identify <laughs> what the best options are, what works by various measures, and, you know, then we can pass regulations or guidance that weeds out the bad practices. Um, I'm, I'm frankly, I mean, you probably know I'm probably inclined to say for-profit debt settlement is all a bad practice or on balance bad, but... You have said that. I have said that. Thank you. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure everyone knew it said it. And, you know, I mean, if we get the data, maybe there's a way to figure out what works, and um, I'm willing to change my mind, but right now we just, we just don't know. Thank you. Rebecca. Yeah, I, I just think a couple things. One is, Sean, I appreciate the, the comments around the uh, best practices. And I think one of the important things around debt settlement is that we do have best practices mm -hmm. that do have the consumer at the core of uh, that outcome. Um, a couple things just before I get into mm -hmm. sort of expanding options. Mm -hmm. um, one is transparency. And I think somebody said it on the FinTech panel, has to go all the way through these key stakeholders. So it's got to be transparency with creditors, nonprofits, for-profits, tech companies. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to come together, including collection companies and, and debt buyers. I mean, this ecosystem needs help. Um, there's loose regulations in some cases, and there's, there's tight regulations in other cases. And I think really understanding what are best practices with the intent of putting the consumer in the very best position that they possibly can be through education, product, program, and follow-up, I think is what we ought to be thinking about. And the other thing I would say is credit outcomes matter. So forcing charge-offs, asking consumers not to make payments on multiple cards, really, and I'm not taking it from a credit counseling perspective, I'm just taking it from a basic consumer outcomes, is bad. It's bad. It's a bad outcome. And I think we need to work together to say, how do we fix this holistically? Let's not stop paying your credit cards when you can pay something on a monthly basis. Let's make sure we have the right principles of transparency coming through. And with that, I think we can come to some best practices on a waterfall basis where, you know, some people just need interest rate reductions, other people need interest rate and fee reductions, and other people clearly need um, principal reduction and then further than that bankruptcy. So really understanding what's required across this debt relief sector is something we've really not done before holistically. And I think we could have great outcomes in, in any case, whether it's for, for profit, nonprofit, et cetera. Um, one thing that we are very uh, aggressively working on with the creditors, for instance, is expansion of programs. 
I think Mike Croxon said earlier that we have one DMP, debt management plan, in credit counseling. That's just not enough. Um, and that comes, by the way, with interest. So you think about 25% enrolled and 75% of the people going away. So how do we solve for the 75% who really need help that we can help? Um, for the last 18 months, we have been working on new programs called debt reduction programs. Um, this is a waterfall that is based on an effective cash flow means test where a consumer is holistically looked at all of their creditors, all of their unsecured debt, and slotted into programs that are affordable payments. Um, some of those affordable payments are, are no interest, and some affordable payments will need to be uh, uh, principal reduction. But where do they sit today on their hardship test? And where can they start making payments that effectively allow them to successfully navigate this bad debt situation? And oh, by the way, I think savings is incredibly important. We have to have a culture of savings as a part of getting out of debt, because we know that $400 emergency is going to happen again. Um, so the combination of that and best practices. It has been a difficult 18 months, but we have effectively worked with many of the large creditors to start to bring some of these forward for charged off accounts. Now what we're working on is can we extend durations to 72 months? So working with regulators, the CFPB, the OCC, FDIC, um, to really say, is it a viable product at 72 months? Let's test it for a couple years and see what that looks like. Um, is it effective for consumers? Is it effective for, for creditors? So it's a win-win situation. Um, and then just making sure that at the end of the day that we have really, really uh, good, solid, simple programs with good transparency across these products, I think is one of the, the most important things that we collectively can do for the future of this. Thanks, Rebecca. Jason. Okay. So and I you're will, the creditor on the panel, I'm so the feel free to, panel, to yes. speak to the creditor side. I will. Thank you. Um, so I think I'll speak to a couple opportunities that I see uh, that we have to improve the quality uh, to the consumer. Uh, one is around choice, and it's, it's been mentioned. Um, and the second will be around transparency uh, specific to, to fees. So when I talk about choice, there, there's multiple facets to choice. And a number of folks have talked about uh, making sure that consumers have choice and the knowledge of that choice. And even on you know, the last panel, uh, uh, Teresa talked about it a lot, uh, to make sure that the consumers uh, have choice throughout the entire process. Um, so when I think about choice, uh, I think about a comment that was made a bit earlier today, that um, the debt settlement companies you know, have the secret sauce that the creditors don't want you to know about. And the scripts that exist at some debt settlement companies, I'm not saying all, but some debt settlement companies, the initial scripts and communications that say, do not contact your debtor, your debtor, your creditor, do not answer phone calls, do not respond to letters, stop paying your creditor. When we have that position at some debt settlement companies, it eliminates choice for the consumers. So we, we heard this morning that uh, there are a number of creditors that provide choice throughout the entire process. Um, and there are short-term programs uh, that have overall reduction in payment size that pay more of the principal. There are long-term programs that do that as well and even suspend all interest. There are programs that allow consumers to skip payments, uh, one, two, up to four payments uh, to, to have extensions to provide relief to that consumer. Uh, there are uh, all the programs um, that uh, the NFCC uh, and, and organizations provide through consumer credit counseling uh, and the things that Rebecca just got done talking about. Um, there are offers, there are programs that consumers should be aware of and should be allowed to make choice on those programs to understand uh, what is the best option for them. Um, I don't want to limit the ability for creditors you know, to provide those options, limit the ability uh, for consumers to make those choice. Uh, and when those choices are limited, it unfortunately leads to sort of lack of trust uh, within the industry and leads to things that aren't necessarily good to the consumer from a collections practices. It's been brought up a couple times here uh, that litigation is in place. When the consumer is told, do not talk to your creditor, do not um, engage in options that might be available for the creditor, there are creditors that then 
uh, will look to litigate, and that's not the options that we necessarily, uh, as an industry, want. Um, I do believe if consumers are allowed to, you know, to make these choices, what will result holistically is that they'll choose things that are less destructive to their bureau, that potentially will cost less, that protect against less desirable collections practices, uh, and that may provide access to future credit. So I do think choice is, is really important. The second thing I want to address is fee transparency. And I know, you know fee is, is, is one of the major concerns that, that we heard about today. Uh, as a creditor, um, you know, we know about uh, the need to disclose fees associated with, with things uh, like loans. And um, you know the way that we do that today is uh, disclosure um, through the Schumer box. Um, the Schumer box is something that's consistent within the credit industry. Uh, it's a box that discloses fees uh, and the full cost of credit. Uh, it was created to simplify credit terms and help customers easily understand and compare rates uh, and fees associated with credit offers. So whatever the program may be, whether it's debt settlement or other programs, I really feel like something like a Schumer box that is very easily understood and presented to a consumer so they truly understand the full cost uh, of that particular program is something that we need. If you go through all the fees that exist throughout the life cycle of a debt settlement program, there is a fee that could be 20 to 25% of the total debt that they enroll um, in the program. That's substantial. We've talked today about the fees associated with 1099C when, uh, when folks have to claim that from an income perspective. There are monthly fees like litigation protection fees that are there. A number of debt settlement companies today also offer loans to pay off their settlements. That loan comes with an origination fee. That loan comes with interest income. When you add all those things up and that total cost to settle on a debt, it's very complex for a consumer to understand that total cost at the point in which they're engaging with a debt settlement company and they are extremely vulnerable. That cost is over potentially four, five, six years. So to truly understand that, to have something in place like a Schumer box would definitely provide some level of transparency in the process. Okay, thanks for those great ideas and options. So now I'm gonna ask you in, to pick one of the options that you've identified as uh, an opportunity to improve uh, the quality of outcomes for consumers and identify whether you see any barriers to uh, that improvement. So Jason, why don't we stick with you and you just mentioned a very specific option, a Schumer box. Can you speak to um, any barriers that you might see? Yeah, I mean, some of those barriers are being broken down today. Uh, and, I, and really, uh, I want to talk. that? So yeah, I want to talk about kind of the communication and engagement. So I talked earlier that there's a lot more engagement between the creditors um, and the debt settlement companies, uh, consumer credit counseling. There's a lot more engagement kind of working together to, to develop products. So, you know, I think about um, as the product's being developed, and you think about the relationship between a creditor and a debt settlement company today, it's very adversarial. And when there is lack of trust between the creditor and the debt settlement company, the person that suffers is the consumer. So how do we build that trust between the two groups? The goal is to resolve consumer hardships um, with really minimal customer impact are not aligned between the two groups. Um, the trust that exists today between folks like the NFCC and the FCAA on the programs that they've created, I believe the reason that trust exists is because they were created with creditors. They were created side by side with regulators. They were created with consumer advocate groups. We are starting to make change in the debt settlement industry today because we are having these conversations and we're making adjustments to the program so that the groups can become better aligned. But until they're better aligned, uh, we're not gonna have uh, the, real, the consumer at the heart of what we do. Uh, earlier, um, you know, it was brought up from Jerry that the consumer always has to be the North Star, and I truly believe that. And if we, if we make the consumer the North Star, um, then we'll solve the things that we're talking about today um, within the industry. The second part that I, I really want to talk about is the transparency uh, to the consumer um, and to the industry. Uh, anybody has heard me talk about this particular subject um, has, has heard me bring this up. 
and it was brought up a little bit earlier from Idzik, um, and it's really around the transparency and knowledge of folks that are on these programs. So the financial ecosystem that exists today is really blind um, to the fact of folks that are working in debt settlement. The credit availability and risk evaluation is blind to consumers on debt settlement programs. My, myself as a creditor, uh, folks can be on a debt settlement program today, and I have no knowledge of that from any reporting agency that I can use uh, that's FCRA compliant. Creditors may or may not want to loan uh, to folks that are in debt settlement programs, but they should at least have the knowledge and be able to evaluate the risk associated with that particular consumer and give them a loan if they want to or not give them a loan if they want to or extend any types of credit to those consumers. So I truly believe there has to be some consistency from a reporting agency perspective. Consumers today don't get the benefit on the Bureau for payments that they make to debt settlement companies. <laughs> So if you look from, if somebody's on a consumer credit counseling program, you know every single month that there's payments being made to that debt. You know that they're on the program, but you also know that there's uh, payments being made to that debt. You see the progress of those payments on the bureau. You see the progress of those payments then allowing potentially for that consumer to have a workout reagent then become current under that particular program. All of those things are very transparent. Um, We'd like to see the same thing um, from a consumer or from a debt settlement program. Okay. Consumers are making payments um, to the to the um, to the debt settlement program for three, four, five, six months into a dedicated account, and you don't see that on the bureau um, at okay. that time. And the consumer should get credit for those particular. Payments. Okay. Thank you. Just to keep things going, uh, Rebecca, what barriers to the ideas you've put forward and that are and actually happening? Yeah, I, I'm going to focus on just the expansion of programs, uh, the debt reduction programs, which is the waterfall of programs from interest only all the way down to principal reduction. Um, this is a very difficult space to A, get transparency in, and B, get consistency and standards in. There has to be standards across the creditor community in order to really effectuate these changes. So I'm not saying they have to be exact, but there has to be a framework of standard program eligibility. Um, the other one is I think it's in our best interest overall to really understand what hardships are defined by. And, and what barriers are there to doing the first objective you noted? The first objective is really, I mean, it, going one by one to each of the creditors is exhausting and, and not effective. Um, going to the top 20 is even difficult because they're all busy and they're all, you know, uh, complex. So I think putting a framework out there by which the creditors should treat hardship um, and whether that's regulator bulletins or whether that's rulemaking or otherwise, I think that is the way to do that. I and mean, we're talking about effective hardships. Um, for instance, in making home affordable, I mean, we have a cash flow test out there, everything's standardized, and most importantly, the consumer understands what's happening. And if they go to one group versus another group, um, it will be standardized, so they'll really understand what to expect. Um, so I would say that uh, rather today we are going one by one to creditors mm -hmm. to do that work. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I, I, I really think there needs to be some standards around um, monthly payments for consumers and make sure that, that that is in their benefit and that it's affordable payment and that we're not telling, requesting, mandating that consumers not make payments and to is the there creditors. A barrier to that? happening? Uh, there, there's, there's no rules that say you can't force a customer into charge off, but I think it's really bad and it, it's impacting access to credit in the future. And I think that if a customer is willing and able to pay, we should have a mechanism for that to happen. Um, and, and I'm not from the debt settlement area, but, but what I've heard is that was the best way to negotiate with the creditors is to hold those payments back and one by one uh, finish those negotiations, which is a really bad, I mean, p talk about putting customers in the worst position. I think that's a bad way to handle this. So 
Okay. I would also look for sort of help, assistance, bulletins, maybe even some rulemaking around uh, monthly payments and, the, and effects on credit. Great, thanks. So Andrew, you said uh, figure out what works, a comprehensive analysis by some impartial third party doing a deep dive to find out uh, using the data what works. Uh, if you could speak to what you would see as any barrier to, to undertaking that or any other improvement that you've heard or would like to discuss. Well, I think the, you know, the biggest barrier to the data is probably the same with any data project getting it. Um, the bigger companies are probably better, probably already capturing it in some form or another, and they, they probably are more likely to cooperate. But to make the project work, you have to get the data from a full range, big companies, small ones, um, ones that are more successful than others. And uh, right now, there's no, there's only one state that I'm aware of that requires any useful data collection. That's, that's Maryland. Um, none of the other state regulators require any useful data collection. Um, the CFPB doesn't require it. And uh, I think that's the biggest barrier. I'd like to see states and, and the Bureau to the extent, and I know there's jurisdictional issues, but I'll let them deal with that. Um, require, I mean, someone, first someone needs to come up with a list of what data needs to be collected. Um, and then, you know, mandate that kind of collection and submission to some kind of, uh, you know, useful place where, like, it's sort of maybe a Humda model that's already done with, with mortgages. So we can see what's working, see what the problems are, and, uh, but in, in, until the data is available and collected, you, well, obviously you can't do anything with it. Thank you. Sean, I'd love to hear your views mm -hmm. on Andrew's uh, proposal. Yeah, it, it, it's, a great, um, it's a great place to, to start um, you know, a conversation about how we actually build some trust, because that word has come up a bunch of times today. And um, I think data and facts are a key part to changing the dialogue that, that uh, the whole ecosystem has with each other. Um, you know, we, we believe a lot in data in our company. We run our business based on data for the reasons I described earlier, uh, meaning that if someone isn't successful, then we're not successful. Um, and that requires that discipline. Um, that said, um, we also do research work to try to understand this. The Regan report was mentioned earlier, um, and someone said, well, why isn't that data made available to us? Uh, to, to you know the broad industry. We can take that to the AFCC and have that conversation. Uh, I will tell you one thing we have done in response to that concern is we've gone out to um, a well-respected economist at uh, Harvard. Will Dobby is the name of the gentleman. He's a professor at, at Kennedy School, and he has taken the data with no influence from the original author or from the AFCC, and he has reviewed the results that came from the Regan Report, the latest one that was Read. It's not yet published. It will be within the next couple weeks, and he's confirming the results. We would hope that that will help give some confidence to folks that this isn't just gaming the data, that the, 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 the data is real. Now, to what extent we have to go further than that and make it all available for you to go through it? Like, we can have that conversation. It's We're asking open to the it. right questions, too. Yeah, sure. asking the right questions, that's yeah. fair. I mean, I think it's a pretty comprehensive review of that mm -hmm. settlement. I think we're very open to the idea if there are other questions that key stakeholders have about how debt settlement is operating, that those get surfaced to us and we can build that into the next version of, of that report. That, that would be one idea. So I think there can be a dialogue around that. Second thing is we personally, or we at Freedom, have done a recent survey around this topic that's come up um, significantly today, which is the impact on credit score. And we were very interested because we had not done this deep dive on the credit score and understood it in the way that we should. Um, and we've spent literally a year on this study. It, it was much harder than we expected. It was working with actual credit data, looking at vintages back five, five, six, seven years ago, and looking for an extended period of time, and saw the impact. And the, and the long story short, and this paper is going to be published this week. It was done by the guy who used to run the FICO product uh, at FICO. His name's Freddie Wynn. He's with our company. Um, the, the answer is debt settlement um, clients, graduates, will reduce significantly. There's a big drop. Surprise, surprise, right? Because they are no longer paying on those, those debts. Um, and by the way, I think most, 
most consumers that are going into debt settlement would like to be paying on those debts, but they can't. That's the reason that they're c coming into this program. It's a significant drop that happens within six months. At six months, as settlements start to occur, because the average settlement is at 4.4 months at this point for our company, very transparently, it starts to come back. And by the time they've graduated, about 45 months, the FICO score is the same on average as what it was when they entered into the program. So that's not destroying somebody's credit score in the same way that you might argue. Actually, bankruptcy has an impact that is longer lasting and, and can live with you longer in a whole bunch of ways, employment, housing, and so on and so forth. So we actually were really encouraged by this. More encouraging than, than it getting back to where it was when they came in was the fact that if you look at the two years that follow when they graduate, you've got a, an increase of another 30 points um, that goes up. So this, this idea of really digging into the data, really understand what's going on, and then building you know, these solutions around that information is something we completely buy into, and we, we want to engage this conversation and do that going forward. So maybe, Sean, when those um, uh, articles or publications come out, we might have another discussion mm -hmm. like this <laughs> where we could discuss those. Absolutely. I, and I think peer review is really important, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, because people can poke holes and look at it from a different perspective. And that's why the Dobby investment, you know, that he spent his time and did that and looked at it is really important. Is there someone else that wants to peer review that data as well? Would we be open to that? I mean, I can't speak for the FCC. I don't represent them. I don't control that well, data. But I, I, I think it's a great idea. Look, we use the Ohio State University, Dr. Stephanie Moulton, to do our external research. And I think it would be really, really interesting if we could collaborate on some of this research mm -hmm. and make sure that the way it's done is, is, is equal across the sector, both credit counseling and debt settlement. I think that would be really interesting. And I, I think really critical, because today there haven't been many comments about outcomes, for example, with credit counseling. Um, and, you know, for example, success rates. Um, and, and let's look at all of the solutions when we do these studies. Mm -hmm. Let's understand the real trade-offs, because mm -hmm. I'm very happy to talk about success rates of debt settlement compared to the other solutions. Here, here's the reality. These consumers are highly stressed. Eight to 10 credit cards, $30,000 worth of debt. They have credit card utilization rates that are in excess of 70%. 45% of them have a personal loan of those that enroll in the debt settlement. They are at the end of a cycle, and that is the, the reality of the situation. Um, and so we want and are very encouraged by the idea that we could have some sort of a engagement around data and then understand you know, which of these solutions make sense for which pockets of consumers. Because at the end of the day, you know, there, there are some consumers, and we recognize that all day long, that are better for credit counseling. There are some consumers that should just go pay it off on their own. There are some consumers that actually should come into debt settlement. I know some people in this room don't want to believe that, but it is true. And some should go bankrupt. If we could all acknowledge that fact, to me, that's one of the main barriers. Yeah. I'll get to my point. Sean, the main I, barriers. If I can just add, yes. do you mind if I no, add to go that, right ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> I think it's a good discussion here. I think you know, one of the things that, that we are looking at is really developing principles. <laughs> around helping the consumer. And everything that we look at, whether it's cash flow monthly to the creditor, whether it's making sure we have the best program that the lowest cost for the creditor, what type of education and savings plan is needed, I think we can develop some real best practices for this debt relief sector. I guess the question is, you know, we're coming at it from very, very different places today. And what I want to be careful is we don't just try to meet in the middle. Um, which doesn't put the customer maybe in the very best place. But I'm encouraged by the discussion, but I think we're a ways apart on some of, some of the practices. So could I just, we have a little bit over 10 minutes. I want to do a couple of things. Maybe this is more of a speed round, but um, asking Sean, Andrew, and Rebecca, if you could speak to Jason's Schumer box uh, proposal, getting to the theme of uh, all day, uh, the need for transparency, the importance of disclosure, the difficulty of achieving a successful disclosure. So if you could just give Give about a minute on what you think are perhaps the um, pros and cons of um, further work towards a Schumer box disclosure uh, for consumers, no matter what the, the product is being offered. I can go first because I think I'll be the briefest. I think it's a good idea, just the problem is at this point I don't know what to put in it. I mean, 
Okay. What, what's well, the best metric? What do people need to know? I think that's true. I mean, I like the idea because it is more transparent. Mm -hmm. I think disclosures, just for disclosure's sake, don't work. Um, I also think that we ought to think about a test that is a benefit test uh, to assess that we are putting the consumer in the absolute right product for them. And, and Rebecca, you, you referred earlier to the HAMP program. Um, could you say a little bit more about that and how you see that would be different from a Schumer box or any other kind of attempt to achieve? No matter what product. Of, um, clear disclosure so consumers know what, what the terms are and therefore what they should actually be qualified for. Yeah, I think that it's if we find a, a simple way to assess, like a net tangible benefit test, that if you put a customer either in a loan or a reage program or a settlement, that they understand the, not only the short term quick fix to their debt, but also what that would mean long term. Um, I, you know, the high cost loan documents are another way to just try to make sure, you know, you have high cost and low cost options. And how do you really present those side by side to a consumer? I think, you know, we'll have to think through what that really might look like. Okay, thanks. Sean, on the Schumer box. So I'm, I'm not a lending expert, so exactly what the Schumer box would look like in this case, maybe Jason, <laughs> fill me in. Um, I, I think that, um, number one, the, the fees are disclosed in a very direct and um, obvious way mm -hmm. in our you know, in our agreements, full stop. Um, how we go about uh, ensuring that people understand exactly how those work over time and the impact on them, I, to me, is the key. It, it, because it's the totality of the program that seems to be most concerning. There's a general concern around just fees are high, and there's another concern about do people understand what they're getting into here. Um, and I think on the fees are harp, high part of it, if we had a different engagement with the creditor world, those fees could be lower. I'll just state that full out. We spend a lot of energy <laughs> on dealing with the friction that is created by the lack of trust and the lack of ability to engage in a way that's efficient and allows the consumer to be at the center of the conversation. So. Um, if we want to deal with fees, let's have that kind of a conversation and try to drive some of the costs out of the system. Um, so, so that's, you know, I think a, a big part of it. Um, okay. You know, okay. Can I just? Yeah, sure. So we're, we have about two minutes each to, to close out. So I'd like if each person, and, and remember your thoughts, Sean, if you can. That's, okay. Okay. Um, and I'd, I'd like us to close out with, with this. Um, so you've heard about several different initiatives, both on this panel and all, you know, throughout the day. So if you could isolate one question you'd have either for one of your panelists here or anything you've heard today, uh, if you could say what that question is and, and what you'd like to see as the next step coming out of this workshop. So a question based on something you've heard today uh, in this panel or others, and then what you would like to see as an, a next step. Uh, by by yourself or by a group or any any stakeholder. So I'll start with Jason and work our way down. Yeah. So one of the you know interesting panels today was was some of the disruption that's going to take place or is taking place within the industry today um, through uh, intelligence, through modeling, through introducing technology into the process. Um, and you know, I would guess I, I, would, I would like to ask you know, Sean, kind of, how, how do you think of that from an industry perspective as it relates to debt settlement overall? Maybe specific to freedom, this disruption that is happening with the industry. How do you see that kind of change in the overall industry? And then a next step out of this program today. Yeah. So I think um, from a next step uh, perspective, what I would like to see is. Um, one is continue to have these conversations. I think the conversations are great um, and they have evolved. I think next is like, what are the major results that are gonna come uh, from the conversation? And I think the next step that I'd like to see is just standardization, consistency, and consumer protections across all um, debt relief type programs. We should all be playing by the same 
rule book. So things that are talked about today, if I go through just a couple of examples really quick. Um, the, we talked about a means test. So bankruptcy has a means test. Any program that uh, the folks associated with the NFCC go through have a means test associated with that. I'd love to see debt settlement have a means test. There is, there's a budget analysis that's done, but the fact that we try to drive everybody to you know a 50, 40% settlement doesn't doesn't suggest that people are actually selling at what they need because that would tell me that somebody would settle at 65 and somebody would settle at 50 versus this sort of industry standard at 40. I like to get away from the cease and desist practice. That'll help build trust within the industry. And I know what Sean would say back is, okay, then you know we need some relief on the litigation tactics and more engagement from from the. Can from I address that one real quick? But hold oh, that dang. thought. Sorry, because because we're we're gonna go right down the line. All right. So am I am I having to answer all these? When they, no, no. So no have rebuttal. Seven questions just at the end. Simply, I'm sure that people will ask other people questions. So just we can talk. You don't have to respond. Yeah, just two or three more to, to finish up on on sort of standardization. Uh, maybe one. Pick no. one more. <laughs> Pick one more. So, um, the, and I'll just go back to the kind of the the reporting. And if I use credit bureaus for example, just consistent reporting to a bureau, just like we do with any other program that exists, whether it's bankruptcy, consumer credit counseling, internal programs, that level of standardization and consistency across all the debt relief would put us on okay. a, a, a playing field that we're, we're, we're all uh, willing to play on. Thank you. Rebecca. Well, I'm going to start with my two things that I'd like to see as next steps. Um, one is a real focus on credit education, financial education, as a backstop to everything that we're talking about in this space. Standards around education, counseling, understanding access to credit and disclosures, all very important backstops to standardize and strengthen. Um, the next piece really is to make sure that we have a continuum of options based on hardship that are not specifically bucketed in charge off and pre-charge off. If a customer has a hardship, they have a hardship now. And forcing them to go worse into credit means do worse things to them now to get better later. So those are my two two pieces. And, and my question really is, again, to Sean, I hate to uh, Sean. you know pile on, but um, it's really, really important. I mean, you're speaking about freedom debt and the practices that you specifically do and, and expect. What about debt settlement as a whole around their public relations campaign, around the marketing tactics, around the aggressive sales nature in at the point of sale? I have real concerns about that, given the consumer's stressful position there. Thank you, Andrew. And ask a question to someone besides Sean. <laughs> if that's possible. <laughs> Well, I'd already decided not to pile on you because you probably know the stuff I'd ask anyway. But um, I, I think maybe the one biggest question I'd have, maybe the more optimistic one, is I'm really excited about these new um, programs that uh, NFCC is working on. And you know, what, what can we do to make those go ahead to get those in, in place? Because I think that's really, I think that'll really be a game changer for a lot of people. Um, I think the next step will be to do what we were just talking about doing. And um, also, I'd like to see maybe just more people in the industry talk about um, the data collection. For, first decide what needs to be collected, and then talk about how we can work on collecting it and analyzing it. Terrific. So, OK, Sean, you get, you get the last word. All right, all right. OK, so um, I'll about, try to hit You get about question. two and a half minutes. I'll, I'll, try, I'll, I'll try to keep it there. On, on the innovation point, it's a really interesting one, uh, because you, you listen to the panel. And there's a lot of change. There's a lot of good thinking. I mean, I, I love Alex. It's great discussion and debate with Alex around his business and just what they're trying to get done. Um, you know, uh, we have to innovate as a company. That's the bottom line. Like, our, not only does our company, but the industry has to change. Um, and our company's completely committed to that. One of the things that uh, you'll see as our company evolves in the next couple of years is a real focus on the consumer being at the center, as you said, financial wellness being kind of that focus in terms of what that consumer ultimately needs to be striving for, helping those people that are struggling and striving and put them in the right program. So we want to have a whole multitude of solutions. We want to use data to get them into the right solution. And then ultimately, we want to support them in that process and be their partner along, because they don't do it on their own. You look at folks that file bankruptcy on their own, they don't make it out. 
Um, and so they, they need support and help as you go through that. So innovation from within, it's hard. We've, we're investing a lot of money, frankly, in, in doing it right now. Um, and you know, hopefully we'll be successful. And I, I'm hoping some of them are successful as well because the market will be more robust as a result. Um, cease and desist came up. We, we stopped the uh, practice, practice of a cease and desist in 2017. So another kind of point that I think people get surprised when they hear some of the things we're talking about, transfers, we're talking about um, cease and desist not existing anymore. We're talking about POAs as an issue that was very problematic for creditors. We changed that. We're responsive, more responsive than we're given credit for, I would say, you know, based on what I've heard today. Um, and we will be going forward. What other? Debt settlement. Oh, the aggressive marketing and practices. So I think it's a totally fair point to say, hey, you're, t you're speaking for freedom. You know freedom. There's lots of other companies out there. We have to have specific standards, and we have to hold companies accountable accountable for that. The AFCC does have an audit process that it puts its members through. And there are folks that aren't members, and there are folks that are members. Changing what's in that audit process and what the standards are would be a very obvious way to do it. Right? Of course, others could argue regulation could be a way to do it. But one step that we're, we're making in, in the FCC and the industry is, in terms of self-regulation is to define what those are and then ho hold folks accountable for it. Sean, um, do you have a I, question? I got one question. Oh, okay. Good. So good. my question is to, to the three, all three of them. <laughs> See, I get three on one because I got to catch up. They don't have to answer well, it. You've you, been they great don't have to answer, answer it, but yeah. they're going to have to answer it at some point to me. Yes. Um, the question is, would you each invest a day of your time to come and visit Freedom Debt Relief and see what actually goes on. Would that be something that you'd be willing to do? That's my question then, to understand. Great, great question. Should, should I answer the question that Andrew had for me? Sure, yes. I, I will do yes. it very quickly. Yes. Um, the debt reduction uh, credit counseling programs are moving forward. We're in phase one implementation today, which is for charged off only accounts. Eight of the top creditors are participating with two others, uh, hopefully on their way. So we believe that plus the 72 month duration test, which will also start in 2020, um, will start to really take hold this year. Um, at the end of this year, we're hoping to expand that to pre-charge off and we're working uh, to get that sort of by the fourth quarter of this year with creditors. Thank you. So with this, uh, we are now at the end of our time, and I have to say I think this has been, hopefully as advertised, an incredibly uh, fulsome, uh, meaty panel with lots of follow-up, uh, Tom Paul, John McNamara, Vanessa McGuire. You, you've got a lot to do, and uh, as, as do others, and uh, please join me in thanking this panel for a terrific discussion. Thank you so yeah, much. Absolutely. You didn't ask your question. So much, Alice. Um, I'd like to invite Tom Paul up for closing remarks. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time and attention today. Uh, I want to thank all of the moderators and panelists who participated in the events. I also want to thank the Bureau staff who were both moderators and other Bureau staff who really made this event possible, uh, including Isabel Bailey, Gandhi, Jim Savage, Brenda Munez, Nu Han Dunn, uh, Raynell Larrys, uh, Crystal Dully, and Cheryl Parker Rose. But I would be remiss if I did not highlight uh, the critical role of Vanessa McGuin in, in this convening. You know, without her persistence, focus, and organization, this event never really would have occurred. So please join me in a round of applause for our dear staff. <laughs> We've been incredibly fortunate to have and have, have learned a great deal from the stakeholders today. Uh, I won't even try to summarize everything that we have heard and all of the valuable insights that have been shared, because I, I don't think I could do justice to what we've heard today. Um, but I do want to underscore that you know this convening is done, uh, but this is not the end. The Bureau will continue to use its tools to protect consumers in the debt relief space, and our rich conversation today will help us do that now and in the future. So thank you all very much. So that concludes uh, today's convening. Uh, I just want to thank everyone who's watching on, who are watching on live stream and remind everyone that a video will be available on our website. Take care.